In this tutorial, we'll learn about slice fracturing in physics lab. We'll start by importing one of the sample 3D meshes, a brick pillar. Now, to manipulate a mesh, we have a number of tools, including an orbit, pan, and zoom tool, which are tied to the O, P, and I keys, which are next to each other on the keyboard, which makes it easy to switch between them. So throughout this uh, tutorial, I'll be uh, hitting O to orbit, I to zoom, P to pan. We have a toolbar at the top which allows us to select various tools as well. The selection tool allows us to click on a chunk to select it, click off the chunk to deselect it. And here again are the zoom, orbit, and pan tools, as well as the zoom to selected to center the mesh in the view. There are two fracturing tools slice fracturing and cutout fracturing. These are the two different fracturing modes that Physics Lab supports. This tutorial will concentrate on slice fracturing. Once a mesh is fractured, there's an explode tool which allows you to push all the pieces apart so that you can see how they fit together, as well as choose what depth of the fracturing hierarchy you want to view. On the right, we have a control panel with three tabs a Tools tab, Materials tab, and Assets tab. The Tools tab is modal and its contents depend on which fracture mode we're in. Currently we're in the slice fracture mode and we have a number of controls which pertain to slice fracturing. The Materials tab allows us to view the different materials in the mesh as well as change their names if we like. We can also import new materials and select which material will be used in the interior of the mesh after fracturing. We can set some of the properties of that interior material, such as uh, the UV scaling as it's applied to the interior triangles. The Assets tab has parameters which do not pertain to the graphical mesh, but rather to the physical or structural properties of the destructible, such as uh, which chunks are to be tagged as debris, whether or not the smallest chunks should crumble into uh, a, an emitter, uh, which chunks are to be tagged as support, and so on. Now going back to the tools panel, we can start off by just using the default parameters and clicking on fracture. You'll see that we immediately get a fractured mesh and there are a number of issues with this mesh. First of all, you can see that there's a lot of aliasing going on with the interior material. So let's look at that. Going to the materials tab, there's only one material in the mesh and it reused that material on the interior since that's all there was. This material is not really a good interior material. You really want something that's going to tile and look like the interior of a mesh. So we can import a texture, load a texture. This, this texture here is a good interior texture and we've made a new material out of it now. You can see that we have two materials in our material library, the original and now the interior. We're going to set this one as the interior material by clicking on this button. And that's better, but we still have an aliasing problem, as you can see. That's just due to the scale. This is a rather large mesh, so I'll scale this texture map, scale the UVs, and you see it's much better now. The fracture settings we have sliced this pillar into 27 pieces, 3 by 3 by 3 slice. Let's see why that happened. The number of slices we chose is 2, and what that means is there will be two slices along each axis. Actually, this is a simplified view of the slice settings. If we hit this button here, the advanced button, we see all of the settings, and we see that we can set the number of slices along the X, Y, and Z axes. 
collapsing that for now, two slices along the x, y, and z gives us our 27 pieces. This was only done once because we chose a depth of 1. If we had chosen a depth of 2, then we would have had the same slice settings done once, and then each of those pieces would have the same slice settings done on them. Let's see what happens. There we go. That's the depth of 2. Going back up to depth 1, we have what we saw before. Depth 2 is what we get when we take each of the pieces from depth 1 and slice them with the same rule. Depth 0 is always the original mesh. Now, what we've been seeing here are regular slices with flat slicing surfaces. If we want something more interesting, we can offset the planes by applying an offset amount, let's say 30%. That just means that within the range that the slicing planes would normally be, we're going to allow some variation of up to 30% of that range. In degrees, we can specify an offset amount for the, or, for the orientation of the planes. In other words, if we have a Z slicing plane, we can offset the normal of that plane by a certain amount from the Z direction. Let's say up to 30 degrees. Now we've only applied this to the depth 2 fracture. We need to also apply these parameters to the depth 1 fracture. The parameters are different for every depth of fracturing in the hierarchy. Getting fracture, this is the result. This is looking a lot more like we might expect from a real material. If we want to see how this behaves in a physical simulation, we can go to the physics playground. This is done by going into the tools menu to playground mode or simply by hitting F12. The hammer tool allows us to apply damage anywhere in the destructible. I strike it and we can see its behavior. Now this destructible is very large and so the gravity setting is not enough for a realistic simulation. Bumping this up, you can see that's a little better. I'll reset this with the higher gravity setting. And we have a better idea of how it will behave. To get out of playground mode, we hit F11 puts us back into the fracture mode. Now let's look at some of the other slicing parameters. Up until now we've been using a smooth slicing surface that is plain, but we can increase the noise parameter to make that surface rough or uneven. To illustrate this, I'm going to just slice along one axis once. So I'll change the max depth to one. I'll look at the advanced settings, and we'll only slice along Z once. Along X and Y, I won't slice at all. With no noise, we get one slice. You'll notice there's still a variation in the offset and the angle of the slicing plane. The noise is given by these three parameters, amplitude, frequency, and grid size. A grid is used to define a height field offset on the slicing plane, which gives the, the slicing surface its roughness. The amplitude is relative to the size of the mesh in percent, and the noise frequency is relative to the grid spacing. 100% um, noise frequency means that it, the noise is pretty much random from grid cell to grid cell, whereas a uh, noise frequency of, say, 25% means that it's a uh, there's less variation, uh, more regularity between grid cells, but over a size of four grid cells, you're going to get roughness, and so on. So for example, if I set the noise amplitude to 25%, and the noise frequency to 25%, Q 
keep the grid size 10. Now I've only modified these in the Z direction because we're not doing any slicing in the X or Y directions. And we fracture. And this is the sort of surface we get. Nice rough surface. If I want more detail, I can increase the grid size. Let's increase it to uh, say 50. That's the maximum. And you can see we get uh, much more detail. And in fact, we get um, uh, some pieces that have come off because we've sliced off uh, some of the outcropping pieces. And since the noise frequency is relative to the grid size, the noise frequency has increased. This might be a good setting for something like wood, where you'd expect some long splintery pieces. Another useful setting is target proportions. To illustrate how these work, I'm going to restore my settings to very simple ones. Um, on depth one, I'm only going to uh, I'm going to have no seams variation, no noise, and I'm going to slice to a depth of three. So I need to take care to reset all my settings at every depth. At depth two, I'll get rid of uh, all the seams variation and noise. And at depth um, three, they're already at uh, no variation and no noise. Now I've got two slices per axis on depth three. I'm going to change that to one. I'm going to do that the same on all depths so that at every depth I've got one slice per axis. Very simple slicing. Now if I fracture, you can see this is what we expect. Um, on the first level we get eight pieces. They are in the same proportion as the original object. Second level, those eight get sliced into eight. Again, very similar proportion to the original, and so forth. But perhaps we want to change that so that we end up with uh, chunks that are not that proportion, maybe square proportioned, cubic proportioned. To do that, we can use the target proportions. Clicking there, and the default is 100, 100, 100 which is the same as 1, 1, 1. It's really the only the relative amounts that, that matter here. Now if we fracture, you can see that the pieces at the deepest level are roughly proportioned uh, as cubes. Not exactly. You can't always guarantee that because of the particulars of the geometry that you're slicing. But in order to accomplish that, you can see what happened. Even though at depth 1, we suggested one slice along each axis, x, y, and z, it decided only to slice along z in order to try to achieve the target proportions. At depth 2, it sliced again. This time, it gave slicing along x, y, and z. And at depth 3, it sliced along x, y, and z uh, in order to try to achieve the target proportions. By experimenting with different parameters, slice settings, variation and noise, and target proportions, you can achieve a wide variety of different uh, effects that emulate different physical materials. This concludes our tutorial on slice fracturing in physics lab.